So this is the Special Legislative Commission to Study Housing Affordability. We have a new name, and this is Thursday, September 14th, at a little bit after 1 o'clock in the House Lounge. CJ, if you could call the roll, please. Certainly, Chairwoman. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. Chairwoman Representative June Speakman. Present. Representative Joshua Giraldo. Minority Leader, Representative Michael Chippendale. Present. From the Rhode Island Foundation, Mr. David Cicilline. From Gross Smart, Rhode Island, Scott Wolf. From the Pawtucket Central Falls Development, Linda Weisinger. Present. From Steel Realty Consultants, Rita Daniel Steele. From the Rhode Island Builders, Mr. David Caldwell. Present. Housing Network of Rhode Island, Melina Lodge. Present. Rhode Island Housing, Amy Raynone. Present. Rhode Island Developmental Disabilities Council, Bob Marshall. Present. The Department of Planning for the City of Providence, uh, Emily Friedman. Present. City of Cranston Tax Assessor, Ken Millette. From One Neighborhood Builders, Jennifer Hawkins. Present. From the Rhode Island Coalition to End Homelessness, Caitlin Fermieri. Present. President of United Way, Rhode Island, Courtney Nicolato. Present. From Housing Works, Rhode Island, Brenda Clement. Present. And the Rhode Island Secretary of Housing, who we are waiting uh, on, uh, Stephen Pryor. We do have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you. So we will, again, once Secretary Pryor arrives, we'll turn the floor over to him. But in the meantime, I'd like to um, note that there are a couple of changes in membership. Professor Kim um, has resigned from the commission. It, this does not um, match his teaching schedule. We thank him for his service. Karen Scott, um, the planner from the town of Gloucester, has also resigned from the commission. We will be working with the League of Cities and Towns to uh, find a replacement that fits the criteria on the um, uh, in the legislation. I want to personally thank Karen for teaching me a lot about housing needs in rural Rhode Island and for being ever diligent in um, putting forth the needs of her community. She really taught us a lot. Um, Caitlin for Marie, is, this is her last meeting and I want to thank you too for your service. Caitlin is moving on to new opportunities, um, including motherhood in her life, so thank you for that. I just saw pictures of the, of the boy. He's adorable. So thank you again very much for your, for your service. So there will be new members coming um, over the next month. We will fill the vacancies on the commission. Um, and I want to thank all of the members uh, of the commission. Every meeting we have makes us smarter as a state. And I, 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 look, for another, I look forward to another year where we will continue to get smarter about this. And um, I don't need to describe the legislative process to you. You're all um, intimately familiar with it. But, but you can see the impact of the work that we do on the bills. You can take responsibility for all of the good stuff in the bills and the stuff that might need tweaking is my fault alone. So don't, uh, but please, please know that your work has done a lot to inform the state about how to move in a positive direction in housing policy. So I want to thank you all for your continued work in this, in this area. Um, I, I see the secretary has, and Hannah is here. And I think, Hannah, you're going to sit there, the assistant secretary, and Secretary Pryor, do you want to sit there or we'll go right over there where, 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 name where your name is? Okay. Um, so um, I'll give you a minute to settle in for the, uh, and let me just note to the members that our next meeting is October 19th. And then it's the, the idea is the second Thursday. That doesn't always work given the um, scheduling at the State House. But we will endeavor to keep you well informed well in advance of when our meetings are. Um, they will be on Thursday afternoons at 1 o'clock for sure. Um, we have a number of items that have come to me over the summer uh, uh, that uh, members of our uh, the state and the legislature and the advocacy community and others have asked that we look into. Um, let me run through that now while the secretary sets, set, sets up and we can see if there are things that uh, you wish to put on the agenda as well. 
Um, we had, did not finish our conversation with the Public Housing Authority, so we do need to have them come back in. They want to talk to us about their capital needs. Um, Karen, in particular, asked that we focus on the needs of rural communities, and we could consider doing a whole session on that um, and find some experts who can inform our thinking on that. I've had a number of requests to take a look at building codes and the extent to which they um, help or hinder the work. I want to emphasize, though, that building codes need to keep buildings safe. And so uh, less expensive and building quickly is not, is not um, good unless we have safe and all the other things that we want building to be. But I know we do have lots of experts in the room. Thank you. Um, we also have had a request to think about positive incentives to municipalities um, that might encourage them, as opposed to the 10%, uh, the which is taken by some municipalities to um, discourage them or to make them push back. So um, thinking about and having folks come in and talk to us about positive incentives. We will be doing a joint session with a Representative Carson's Commission on Older Rhode Islanders. We'll do a joint session on the housing needs of Older Rhode Islanders. Uh, I would like to have a session that, I don't know if we can do it all in one, that focuses on financing. We've talked a lot about money, but I think we need a, uh, a focus session on uh, how all these, I keep hearing 17 or 18 items in the, in the so-called capital stack. So I think we probably need to make sure that there aren't obstacles there that make it difficult to pull that together as quickly as possible. Um, we have also heard lots about um, Man, uh, manpower is not the word we use now. Um, staffing issues, planners, planners, planners. I don't know if there's anything we can say or do to encourage people to go to school for planning. Maybe we can, uh, and but we know that there's a deficiency of planners. And if there's a way that we can talk about that here, perhaps in collaboration with other groups, um, uh, we hear about regulations and paperwork as an obstacle to development. So we can probably focus on that in one of our sessions as well. Uh, and I have a question about the bond, which may come up in this session or we may have to take a look at that at a later session. So that's the list that I've developed from going through my notes with, of conversations with folks over the summer and um, earlier. If there's anything that you want to add to that, commissioners, please let us know, and we will begin to develop a schedule for the remainder of the, the year. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Secretary Pryor and Assistant Secretary Moore. Assistant? Associate? Deputy? Whatever you want to call Well, no, it's your, you have an Critical. official title, I'm sure. But, okay. Critical. Great. Um, thank um, you. So uh, welcome, pleasure. and please proceed. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, really glad to be back before this commission. Um, this really is an invaluable forum. Um, you all know this to be true. It is not an is your, exaggeration. Pardon me. Is oh. your mic on, red light on? Red is on. Lean in, and then, or pull it closer to you, then, yeah. if you would. Let's try this. How's that? Oh, much better. Cool. Thank you. Once more, audible? Yes. Wonderful. So this commission has been invaluable to us, no exaggeration, and you know it to be true, that a number of the things I'm about to speak of were based upon ideas generated right here in this room uh, with this commission, and we uh, really value this forum. We're going to share some information today that is truly uh, hot off the presses. Um, we want to, based upon Chair Speakman's invitation, drive towards the ability to say some things out loud, uh, inclusive of our next step forward, uh, the most important and first step pertaining to our statewide planning exercise. So uh, we have a lot to discuss today. We're really grateful that you offered us this slot, and let's go. Um, it's been a, a very, very busy summer. Uh, we were blessed with a uh, truly uh, successful progress-filled legislative session uh, with thanks to you all and to General Assembly leadership generally. And we've been feverishly working to implement uh, with leadership from Assistant Secretary Hannah Moore and our small but growing team a variety of programs. I'm going to speak mostly about those. I'm going to also set the scene a bit and talk about things that are not precisely program. So here we go. Challenges in context, recent progress and upcoming opportunities, and looking ahead. On the housing challenges front, nobody has, no entity has studied this more than this one, uh, but it does matter that we uh, consistently remind ourselves, uh, unfortunately our state is coming from behind. This problem is decades, plural, in the making, uh, but uh, we have the lowest housing production rate in the United States. Uh, there are a lot of contributing factors. 
there has also been significant progress in the legislative session and programmatically to take aim at this, but just as the problem has not arrived overnight, it will not be solved overnight. Um, and you know the stats, but 150,000 households are cost burdened in our state, uh, paying far too much towards rent and utilities. Um, on resource investment, we have had in modern history um, an unfortunately low level of public investment uh, in housing. Um, we've begun to correct that, begun um, to correct that, emphasis on the term begun. And on homelessness, uh, we have a high homelessness count. We do slightly better as pertains to sheltered versus unsheltered, but none of this is nearly good enough. None of us are satisfied, and we must continue to address homelessness, including emphasis upon this coming winter and well beyond. So progress in the legislative session. We have not thoroughly reviewed these points. Nonetheless, I'm going to talk about them in compact form because many of you all are extremely familiar with these legislative measures and we can touch upon the ones that folks have questions about. I am going to get into the ones that involve program and status of implementation today. Uh, so uh, reminder that we saw in excess of $100 million, 101.5, in fact, added to our $250 million for housing, production, preservation, and other activities in this past session. Financing for projects, tools for municipalities, a new proactive development entity, and homelessness investments among the features. I'm going to get into those today. We were authorized to establish a state low income housing tax credit. I'm going to get into that today. Um, and of course, the speakers and chair speakmans and General Assembly's set of bills pertaining to making the development process more efficient and predictable, most passed. We're in the process of implementing those. I'm focusing on the funded programs today. Um, we were also authorized for new positions. I'll talk about that. Okay. Let's get into s some depth on programmatic activity. Um, we've tried to highlight ones that we thought would be especially of interest to the commission. We can answer questions on any of the above. As you all know, the regulatory process, rulemaking process, implementation process is not a single step one. Um, we are at different stages of implementation. Sometimes formal regs are required. Sometimes the pandemic recovery office of the state must, in consultation with federal rules, offer guidance and approvals. You get the idea. It, uh, it, it cannot be done instantly, but much, much progress has happened already in, in a, a couple of short months since, uh, since these laws took effect. Okay, on transit-oriented development, this commission has appropriately emphasized that we need to build density where there's underlying infrastructure that will enable such growth. Um, the General Assembly took up its own bill pertaining to a TOD technical assistance-oriented measure, and the McKee administration introduced funding programs. Uh, there's intersection between the two. Uh, the funding programs in the main fund, in terms of the largest dollar amount, about $4 million funds, gap financing for projects in TOD proximate locations. So um, that's what you see on the left-hand side, resources for new development, and then there's the TA component. Uh, so we're in the rulemaking process on the larger funded program. Uh, we have uh, quite deliberately reached out to relevant stakeholders uh, and invited input, uh, and we've got some key members of our team doing that at RIDOT, at RIPTA, at The League, at Housing Works, at GrowSmart. Thank you all who have intersected with us. More informal coffees and conversations have happened too. Um, we've presented on program regs recently at the Transportation Advisory Council today there was a meeting of the State Planning Council in part on this very subject as we form our rules for this program. Uh, the basic gist is that this program will enable us to fill project gaps as demonstrated in a pro forma, analyzing sources and uses. A gap is presented if there is a transit hub proximate location 
in a competitive process, it can be selected. There's much more nuance to it. That's the fundamental point. On the technical assistance front, what we are predominantly aiming for is enabling municipalities that wish to upzone proximate to transit hubs to do so. It's a two-phased approach. You see the second bullet on the right-hand side. There, our anticipation is there will be a tentative award to a town identifying a potential TOD zone based on the language in the statute, and then the municipality will engage a consultant that will help, to Chair Speakman's point earlier, not everyone's got a planner. There are multiple ways we're addressing that. In this instance, bring on a consultant, carry out the work to upzone to prepare the way for TOD-related residential development activity. You all may recall from the statute, we are in part but not exclusively guided by the radius measures. Depends upon the feature of the program, but there's a, uh, just to remind you, well, what does it mean to have a TOD zone? There's a reference to a quarter mile radius of a regional mobi mobility hub, and there are definitions, and there's a one-eighth mile radius of frequent transit stop locations which is defined by RIPTA as every, every 15 minutes within their system. So it gives you a sense for we're baking those in, accepting more input, carrying out the program. Are there any questions about the TOD? Okay, great, thank you. Proceed. For sure. Speaking of capacity building at the municipal level, um, municipal fellows, an idea in part birthed right by, uh, by you all in this room in dialogue regarding the bandwidth issues that cities and towns authentically have in, term to, in terms of carrying out this work. Um, there have been previous iterations of this proposal in previous legislative sessions, but for the first time we introduced a focused fellows program with the focus being upon housing development, and it passed as part of our package. Um, so here's what we anticipate. There's been much consultation on this as well. I'm not gonna illustrate every time the outreach that has been occurring but there's been outreach, uh, especially in this instance where it's squarely municipal with the League of Cities and Towns. Um, we are anticipating that a third party will administer the program. It will still have a strong connection to the Department of Housing. There'll be a mutual learning program, in essence, the creation of a fellowship for the municipal fellows where they can learn from one another as to their experiences, trade notes, trade best practices, and also learn from practitioners even uh, certainly in our midst here in Rhode Island, even from around the country. Um, there's an RFP in process for the third party entity to run the program. Then subsequently there'll be a solicitation out to individuals interested in serving as candidates, meaning in effect staff to the towns. You get the idea as to the sequencing. Um, we're gonna reach out to, and there've already been preliminary conversations with Graduate programs, again, I'm so glad for the preface here, Madam Chair, graduate programs in planning and related fields right here in Rhode Island, alumni offices, career development offices, to as, at least ensure one pipeline for these purposes. We've gotten good responses. Uh, so you get the idea, I've said most of it in the course of the explanation. Uh, we will allow municipalities, by the way, to team up. So if there's the idea of regional work on regional projects, and there are multiple instances that we all might have in mind where that could make sense. We'd welcome it, it's not required. And there are other forms of flexibility we're creating in the program. Any questions on the fellows program? How many fellows do you anticipate having in any given year? Do we have a leader's count on that? It'll be a handful and we'll get back to you on the budgeting. A handful. Yes. And then um, is there an expectation, so these fellows will be paid when they do their work. Yes. Is there an expectation in the program that they would remain in the state to serve, continue serving in this capacity? Not a requirement because frankly, we didn't want to limit the candidate pool given the job market. Yeah. But our hope is that the fellowship will make it very attractive. The sense of camaraderie, frankly, the opportunities that open up in towns plural. Thank you. Other sure. questions on this? Thank you, proceed. Thanks, Han. Um, housing related infrastructure. As you may recall, another measure we undertook to help cities and towns overcome barriers was that we created a special infrastructure fund just for municipalities aiming to overcome an infrastructure barrier to housing production. Um, that 
requ the, quest the request in the governor's budget from the housing department was that the program be placed at the infrastructure bank and that the program be crafted with guidance from the department, from the housing department. That's in fact what's happening. So the infrastructure bank uh, aims to issue an RFP towards the end of the month. Uh, an information session was held with the league, took place last week. The infrastructure bank is vigorously at it. Uh, proposals eligible for funding are for pre-development and development of site-related infrastructure. Think of it as last mile, not in the literal sense of a mile being required, but the last linkage for a roadway, for, ro for water sewer, for other utilities. Um, pre-development work can occur or, in fact, direct investment in the infrastructure pertaining to a developable site for housing purposes that will be activated but for activated given the infrastructure. Once again, municipalities may, may, may uh, join forces. We anticipate that if these programs persist beyond one year, you know, we may not get teaming up towns instantaneously, but maybe in future years as people come, be, become familiarized. So those are the basic updates on that program. Any questions on that program? Thank you. Okay, financing affordable housing. We know this is central to our portfolio of programs, and we know it is of high interest in this room, as it should be. So um, many are familiar with the fact that Rhode Island Housing, to its great credit, has established a one-stop application process through which multiple programs are interwoven in a single application so as to make some of the program features and the decision making less the necessary point for developers, less the focal point for developers who have a lot to do to put projects together. And what's visible to the developer is the application and problem solving occurs and solutions occur uh, on the Rhode Island housing side. So uh, the goal is to affirm that and to place not all, but uh, some of our significant programming through that process. Um, preface to my points about w one of them, priority projects. Uh, there was work done over the course of the summer on the qualified allocation plan. That's the annual revision, if there are to be revisions, to the QAP, which governs especially tax credit allocation under LIHTC. Every state does it. FYI, with a close collaboration with the executive staff of Rhode Island Housing and our housing department team, we were sure to focus some new attention upon and make even more prioritized extremely low income housing unit production, ELI unit production. Um, and that happened, so that revision uh, has occurred uh, and that there was public input in the QAP, there was uh, department and board input uh, at Rhode Island Housing, um, and this uh, plan will soon be enacted. So it's in effect, in effect done. Notation, our previous round of funding under Carol Ventura at Rhode Island Housing included 353 new housing units at 30% of AMI or below eight, uh, extremely low income units. So we're already off to the races for these purposes, but we wanna make sure that in future allocation rounds, we're especially supporting our most vulnerable residents given the extraordinarily tight, in fact, overheated housing market and uh, vulnerable residents suffering the most under such conditions. So QAP changes, please uh, review the QAP. Those of you who will intersect with these processes, there are more than I'm referencing here. Um, we will include in the one-stop application process the Priority Projects Fund as one of the sources interwoven uh, on the Rhode Island housing side of the application process. That's the $27 million for the development of housing for our most vulnerable Rhode Islanders, inclusive of but not exclusively focused upon permanent supportive housing. Uh, there's a process of dialogue uh, regarding the establishment of sp more specific criteria for this purpose. Um, the anticipation is that 
by next month, there will be an issuance of the one-stop application, inclusive of this new edition of the Priority Projects Fund. Let me pause there. Yes, any questions about this? Yes, Kate. I don't have a question, but I just wanna thank you for the recognition of uh, prioritizing for those of extremely low income and priority projects for people um, that may reside in uh, facilities like permanent supportive housing with the unsheltered numbers and homelessness at the rate that it is. Housing really is the solution, and what we see time and time again is those experiencing homelessness are extremely low income, so I'm very exactly. happy to see that. So I just wanted to say, not a question, but recognition. That's Appreciate good, that. thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. And as you've emphasized, prevention needs to be part of our overall collective effort pertaining to homelessness, and we must have the ability to place folks um, in housing if they wish it. Thank you. Anything else on this? Great, thank you. Proceed. At long last, a state low-income housing tax credit. Uh, so uh, Rhode Island was one of only two states in the eight-state northeastern region without a LIHTC at the state level to serve as a companion for the federal 9 and 4% tax credits. This enables us to leverage especially the 4% uh, with greater frequency and enables us to fill more project gaps. The General Assembly was kind enough uh, to honor our proposal via the governor's budget to offer a $30 million annual allocation for the purpose, it should be noted that the LIHTC financing, i.e. the $30 million, is not drawn from the federal American Rescue Plan or any other federal source, deliberately so. We aim for this to be a permanent part of our portfolio of programs. Um, so uh, it's authorized on that basis for multiple years. Uh, the project does need to qualify under the federal LIHTC program to be eligible under the state LIHTC program. Um, it's a five-year award term, and we're going to codify this in regulations. I should note, all of this is being, on a draft basis, built into regulations, and there's a formal process of the state for that purpose, but I'm previewing features. It's a five-year award term. Why do I emphasize this? The federal tax credit is awarded over 10 years. Obviously, as pertains to the time value of money, a shorter term for the same face value brings greater ultimate value to the project pro forma. So we sought authorization and received auth authorization from the General Assembly for a five-year term. It's worth noting that in commerce's cases where there are tools for development purposes, uh, for example, the, the Rebuild Rhode Island tax credit is awarded over five years. So our state is accustomed to this time interval, and it's highly advantageous to uh, the project to not award uh, in a congruent time frame, meaning 10 years. So that's what we're going to do. Um, most states that have LIHTC programs have a longer time interval, and I believe only Vermont in the Northeast also has a five year. So we will be, you know, building affordable housing is not per se a competition, but we are coming from furthest behind in the country on key measures, right? So we need to have, in that sense, the most competitive program. We aim for that at every turn. $30 million is generous on a proportionate basis, and five years delivers more bang for the buck. Okay. Um, we expect draft oh, regulations okay. in the winter based upon the, um, the precise protocols of the regulation drafting process. And we will subsequently issue a solicitation to developers for this purpose. It is not currently uh, our anticipation that realistically this program can be folded into the one stop. We haven't stated that it would be, but I just want to state that it will be on a different time frame based upon the fact that in this particular case, unlike other programs like the Priority Projects Fund, the legislation requires formal regulations. So, but there will be, beyond the winter, a competitive process for this purpose for those projects that are eligible for federal LIHTC. 
more details will be possible as we get through the formal regulatory process as to how exactly all of that will work. I'm trying to offer precursor points in the direction of where we're going. Thank you. Questions about this? Yes, please. Brenda and then Melina. There I go. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the information. Just to, and this may be part of the regulatory process, and I'm sure you've already started thinking about this, but just the interaction of the state low income housing tax credit with the rebuild credits and the state historic credit. And can you comment generally on that? Uh, sure. The other uh, I guess it's not really a concern, but just another comment in terms of the state credit in credits themselves don't work without permanent subsidies to mm -hmm. get at the income yes. targets that we're talking about. So some, some coordination with the um, consolidated application round is going to have to happen yeah. in order for it to be successful. But anyway, yeah. I'm sure these are already things that you're thinking about, but we'd love to hear your they, thoughts. They merit emphasis. Uh, so you're right, you're right to raise it, Brenda. Um, agree with all of your points. Um, and I will say that um, on the issue of LIHTC not being enough unto itself, which is kind of your theme across the different points. Um, it certainly is true. Um, we will look to, if a project is a historic rehab project and an adaptive reuse is anticipated, we will obviously look to ensure that the project has aimed to avail itself of existing federal resources like the federal historic tax credit. Um, less realistic to look to the state historic tax credit at the moment given the queue and the status of the program. And we will look to other such direct matches that a project should already be seeking. So that I'm not gonna say that this is exclusively a last dollar program, but we'll look to see that the obvious first dollar moves have been made. On the issue of subsidy on the residential tenant side in all their forms, absolutely essential, and we have to do more work on these fronts. My, my biggest theme across all of these topics is our work is not nearly done. We have to go into the next legislative session as this commission aims to do with a package to follow upon. Melina? Okay. Thank you. Um, since we were talking about um, sort of how it works with, with other credits, uh, has any thought been given how this program would function um, in partnership with the rebuild credit given the prevailing wage requirement that would trigger under that program? And do you see this particular tax credit potentially getting sucked into that same requirement, would, would, which would obviously change the effectiveness of the credit? I cannot speak to the General Assembly's mindset on the scope of its, uh, of its endeavors pertaining to um, prevailing wage or project labor agreements. What I can say is if rebuild credits were to be utilized, the rules would apply and therefore it would apply across the project, obviously. If a project did not seek rebuild credits, those rules would not apply, obviously. We do not view rebuild as a predominant tool in our toolbox. The reason we created a new toolbox under the housing department was to have residential development specific tools. And there too, our work is not done. Yes, please, Cinda. Hello. Hi. Hi. Just a quick question on the long term future of this potential source of funding, mm -hmm. because again, it's great if it's a year or two, but. Can you talk about the long-term future and sustainability and commitment to yeah. this sort of funding long-term? Uh, we sought in the governor's budget a five-year authorization for the program from the get-go with $30 million each of those five years, and we were granted that. So this is a five-year program at a minimum. It can be evaluated, and I hope that we all judge that especially after we iron out any challenges that may emerge with any program, including this one, that we want it to be sustained and maybe even expanded, but five years, which is, uh, as you know, quite unusual for an initial authorization. We're pleased with that. Other questions? So my fellow commissioners know that tax credits are one of the many things that befuddle me. So I just have a, a simple question, and that sure. is uh, all of the tax credit programs that you mentioned, there. 
if I recall correctly, they are all administered by different agencies, right? Historic is revenue. That's right. Uh, federal mm -hmm. is Rhode federal Island is. housing. Yes, and for, for LIHTC, yes. Department federal of Historic is a federal, federal program. Yeah. Federal LIHTC is in effect administered by Rhode Island Housing in accordance with federal rules. Um, the, um, the rebuild program is a commerce program. We happen to have mentioned that a couple times. I, again, I don't think that looms large for our purposes. Um, and this program is a housing department program. And we will work in tandem with Rhode Island Housing in a variety of ways. For example, underwriting, for example, joint uh, consultation and administration, depending upon the program, but this is a housing department program. So we shouldn't be surprised that it takes a year and a half to put these financing packages yeah. together, right? Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, the, no problem. The, yeah. Any other questions on this one? Okay, and, and welcome to um, David Cicilline, who has joined the table. Thank you for coming. Um, next, please. Nope, I'm sorry, can, Jen. No, no, go right ahead. I didn't see your hand. Thank you. Um, Secretary, I just wanted to, again, acknowledge the big lift of changing the QAP to allocate additional points for ELI, so I commend that change. I um, actually just have a question before we move the topic onto non-financing um, streams, something that I don't see in the PowerPoint deck here, but curious how the, uh, the public housing authority um, pool of funding has, has there been a great deal of interest? Is it fully it expended? And what are the themes that you've seen emerging from the asks? I'm curious how that uh, is going. Um, the short answer, and then I'll give a long answer. The short answer is that awards have been made or are in the process of being make, made. So I'm going to give public answers that are as, as I've been doing with everything, a little bit ahead of where we are in the process, but not totally. So on themes, I'll have to get back to you, and on some of the precise features of the awardees, I'll have to get back to you. I will tell you this, though, because it's a program we all care about. I'm glad for the question. Five PHAs have been funded for a total of $1 million. Um, the, the award amounts are 250000 for technical assistance, 750000 for pre-development. Uh, four of the four of the five, just so you get a feel for this, have been notified, and one hasn't yet. So we're just in the midst. Um, and Amy, if you want to supplement Amy Renone at all here, feel free, but I'm trying to preserve the process. Uh, but it's a, it was a highly in-demand in set of awards. We're very pleased with the responses, and we'll, uh, we'll all track the PHA's implementation. Amy, anything else you would like to add? Great. Okay. Um, I know you referenced the rebuild as not being significant mm -hmm. towards, uh, towards housing development, and I, you know, we can always argue what's significant mm -hmm. or not. Um, but as of a list that I saw from 2022, there was something like 660 units developed using the rebuild credit, half of which were affordable. So I would encourage you to spend some time thinking about if a rebuild credit triggers uh, a prevailing wage standard, what that impact would mm -hmm. look like on our particular projects. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, the more expensive a project is to bring to, to bear, mm -hmm. uh, the less units we can produce with a finite number. Mm -hmm. So thank you. The only thing I'd like to say is gratitude for the recognition that, you know, while the predecessor team was at Commerce and this, this emphasis continues with our successors, we cared a lot about producing housing. So I'm not diminishing the tool. What I'm expressing is, quite frankly, it's not within my toolbox. And there may be instances where we can join forces, but we want to ensure that there was a toolbox dedicated to housing. Um, okay. Um, in addition, as you all may recall, we wanted to ensure that there was a nimble entity, an agency, dedicated to supporting nonprofit and for-profit developers and other participants in the development process in navigating those, those processes and carrying out the development work. Okay, what does all that mean? There's a good analogy, actually, in what we did do Hannah and I, while at Commerce, 
across different categories of development, obviously including commercial non-residential. At Commerce, some of you all have had contact, some of you extensively, there's a business development team that fosters development right within the state, helping small businesses grow, helping medium-sized and larger businesses grow, attracting new business to Rhode Island, producing jobs for Rhode Islanders. And then there's an investment team and an investment division. That investment division evaluates the proposals for tax credits and grants, in effect underwrites them, sift them, sifts them, vets them, gets them ready for decision, and in fact participates in the decision. Two sides of the house. We felt like we needed to do even more to help position both Rhode Island Housing and the department to do investment. We also felt that we needed to do more fostering of the development so that we can come from behind and see more projects advanced, especially as pertains to affordable housing, but inclusive of the whole market. So we proposed a proactive development entity. It will be a subsidiary of Rhode Island Housing and that decision was very deliberate because we're too small a state, small but mighty. However, we didn't want to, ensure, we didn't want to have a proliferation of agencies that were not connected to one another. So this will be a subsidiary of Rhode Island Housing connected uh, to its activities and will help to do a variety of things, help to identify land for development, housing development, help to assemble parcels, working with developers, help to analyze capital stacks and determine whether there are financing sources that may not have been thought of by the development team and also how to decode, how to decipher the various governmental programs at the state level, in, at the federal level, even at the municipal level. You get the idea. In effect, the equivalent of business development focused on housing with an emphasis on affordable housing. We were authorized by the General Assembly. There was some startup funding allocated. We're working very closely with Carol Ventura and the Rhode Island housing team to establish this. And to be noted that we're busily recruiting personnel for the Department of Housing. Uh, some new hires uh, are already in process and more on the way, uh, including some at the senior most level. We are also working with Ms. Ventura on uh, soon posting for and recruiting for the head of this entity. So I want to share out good progress there and more to follow. Um, a question from Melina. Since I have a lot of questions, it might actually just be faster to do them as we go. Um, I'm curious if you could give a bit more specifics around the positions that you've already hired for, uh, the ones that are currently posted and those that you plan to post. Mm -hmm. um, and if you could speak a little bit about your efforts to um, recruit Rhode Island candidates mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we can hit the ground running and we don't have an extensive learning curve. Yeah. Thank you. So um, we've posted um, north of 10, I think it's 11 positions already. Uh, we are far along with a number of them. Among the postings includes uh, positions of the kind we've discussed in this room, a deputy secretary for, for housing focused on housing production and preservation with an emphasis on affordable housing, a, an executive director for homelessness and community supports, a top member of our team for the purpose of homelessness related activities, also positions in the next tier in housing and in homelessness, also positions related to operations, management, finance, and legal. Uh, so uh, we are close to hiring uh, in a handful of instances and we'll have more to say about it. Thank you. So I heard two positions yeah. specifically named, but it sounds like you're at 11. Um, the intent to bring on Rhode Island yeah. candidates? For sure. We will see a mix. Has we there been a more We will certainly emphasize local recruitment, and we will also emphasize reaching beyond. Can you speak a little bit to the strategy around ensuring that Rhode Island candidates are outreach to? Extensive advertising, extensive outreach, incorporating into 
just publicly posting and also incorporating to basically everything we do. It's a chief topic in most meetings that we hold or most presentations that we do in Rhode Island. And we're not doing those meetings or presentations anywhere else. And we will also have more to say on how we will uh, boost our efforts around recruitment soon. For our vast television audience, could you tell them where they could go to see these postings, please? Sure, it's on the portal of the State Human Resources Department. Do you have a way to say that better than I just did? <laughs> I can tell you how I do it. I search apply government jobs Rhode Island and then they pop right up. Um, we can follow back up with Thank the, you very much. Link. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, David. Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I, could you just uh, describe a little bit, I mean, maybe you did this uh, earlier and I missed it, but with respect to this proactive development entity, as you were describing its functions, it sounded a lot to me like Rhode Island Housing. Mm -hmm. So what are the functions that this entity will perform that Rhode Island Housing yeah. doesn't already do, and what was the value of a separate entity yeah. rather than more resources to Rhode Island Housing? who have felt like is already doing this work? First, let me just say as a preface to my answer that the reason we decided to create it as a subsidiary of Rhode Island Housing is out of, recogni out of recognition of the abundant good work happening there. So uh, the goal was to stay close to the work of Rhode Island Housing, but also animate some more activity. What does that mean? It's the analogy I was aiming to draw, but let me try to say it better. You have investment on one side. That's not exclusively, but predominantly what Rhode Island Housing does. It solicits for applications for funding, tax credits, grants, and beyond. It receives applications. It reviews those applications. It does a great job of awarding with enormous complexity as pertains to the rules and the number of applicants, and we're always, uh, we're always oversubscribed. So it does that. What we wanted to beef up was the business development equivalent, the, the helping the market get applications together, the pre preparation of land, identification, assembly, pre-development work, problem solving around the capital stack, not just advertising and underwriting the programs we have, but are there federal resources available? Are there, in fact, sir, charitable resources that might be available? Are there programs beyond the scope of the Department of Housing or Rhode Island Housing that might be applicable within the state constellation. That's work we know we can do more of, leaning into the development process and doing that, that half of the work. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Brenda, please. Can I just follow up on that? I mean, uh, to your point, uh, uh, Cong I don't know what to call you now, <laughs> David. Uh, <laughs> um, Rhode Island Housing, in my opinion, already has this authority, has already created the, um, the entities at varying times uh, to manage and develop processes. I get what you're saying in terms of kind of the nuance to this, where you're trying to be more proactive and going out and encouraging development. But at least from somebody who's lived through several iterations of this before when they've tried to do development, it's a cautionary tale um, when the state yeah gets in the role of being a developer or gets closer yeah. to that, there needs to be sufficient safeguards and guardrails in that yeah. work and that activity. Yeah. Because you've taken, when you become the developer yourself, you've taken out that required, you know, role that a state should be playing about how come, why not, or, yeah. or why are we funding this project? So I look forward to further discussion, but it is something that um, have, having watched yeah. This crash and burn several times I have great concern about. Yeah, I just I do want to respond to that. First of all, your caution is merited and well taken. We share it. What I would say is this. Despite remarkably good, even heroic work by Rhode Island Housing, despite the work of a lot of the stakeholders in this room, we have a broken system. We are nowhere near equal to the task on producing housing in our state. We have the worst rate of production in the country. It is not enough simply to set up programs and passively wait for the development to happen. It's not enough. We won't get there from here. Now, do we shed our safeguards? Absolutely, positively not. And what we know from close to home examples like Rhode Island Housing, like, excuse me, Rhode Island Commerce, 
close to home examples like commerce, is that you can sustain both sides of the house. And Melina usefully pointed out to us that there was even a lot of housing production in our tenure at Rhode Island Commerce. And you have different sides of the operation conducting different kinds of work and you maintain the appropriate controls. But let me just say this, we must exercise caution. We have to preserve integrity, but we also have to do some new things to help the market generate more activity, especially as relates to affordable housing, or we'll never get there. So that's why we can't simply exercise caution. We need to appropriate, appropriately implement the controls and we also have to devote the resources, the personnel, and the apparatus to get the job done. Thank you. Other comments or questions on this piece? Thank you. No Proceed. problem. Thank you. Um, okay. Homelessness. And I just have the feeling like I should probably go rapidly. I don't want to diminish this profound topic. Well, but we if there's any moment where you, Madam Chair, want to tell me, we're integrating the Q&A into the presentation, as you can tell. Great. We have been doing that. Great. So, um, and we have a half hour left. So. Got Thank it. You. And my, the members feel perfectly comfortable intervening, as you know, in your presentation. I, I love it. Thank you. And we Good. need it. Good. Go, go ahead, um, please. So, um, so this, is, I, this is the segment on homelessness, so you'll hear me move through a, a variety of sub-segments on the topic, okay? So Municipal Homelessness Support Pilot Initiative. This was a uh, smaller dollar amount, $2.5 million in the budget, but I just wanted it to go noticed rather than unnoticed. Cities and towns expressed to us, you heard some of it in this room, you've all heard it in the course of your professional work, that in undertaking, for example, the expansion of a shelter, the establishment of a new winter center, a municipality might be concerned that there's more sanitation service required of the town that there might be more ambulance calls to a given site given the increase in population density. That, in fact, public, public safety personnel might be called uh, to the site. We want to have a tool through which to offset municipal expense if demonstrably such expense exists, so we created this. It's a $2.5 million fund, and you see a variety of the criteria that we're setting up. Uh, once again, in concert with the league, but there's a variety of services you see displayed on the right-hand side that can be applicable, um, and we're setting up a, an application-based process for cities and towns to avail themselves of these funds. You can, you can see across all of the programming, what we're aiming to do is alleviate concerns and take down barriers at the same time that we offer new resources to get projects done, inclusive in this case of more shelters and centers for Rhode Islanders experiencing homelessness. Questions on this? Keep going. One, oh, please. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, I just want to be sure that I jotted down something you started off your comments with. Uh, I think it was very important. Prevention must be part of our, of our overall approach very sloppy handwriting. Um, it sounds to me as if you said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Yes, sir. Is that That's the, better said, but yes. Is that the department's position on homelessness? It is. It is. Okay, good. I just want to make sure that I heard it. It is, clearly. and I'm displaying a slide that can speak to it, but please go, keep going, sir. No, no, I, I just wanted to make sure that I, I did jot down accurately what the position of the department is. For sure. Excellent. And I'll say, look, and I, I looped together in response to Caitlin's point prevention and housing production. And I did so deliberately because prevention can be illustratively, you can see uh, displayed on this slide that it's part of our, even our winter strategy. Um, this is page 20. That, for example, we've invested, we the department, through another discretionary allocation, $3 million for a year's worth of work by RILS, the Legal Services Division, in concert with other legal service providers on eviction prevention because it is far better that we help Rhode Islanders stay in their homes if there's an appropriate legal route to that 
far better than us setting up shelters and building out other alternatives, obviously. From a cost effectiveness perspective and from the perspective of the client families and individuals. So that's an example of prevention. But another example of prevention is simply producing more housing stock, uh, such as permanent supportive housing that can work for folks who would otherwise be at risk of homelessness or are currently homeless. Because those folks may be housed now and are one month away from finding themselves in the situation where they too are competing for the very limited resources. Exactly. So keeping folks housed who are currently housed is the objective. Clearly, it's articulated here, and it, 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 I'm happy that that is uh, part of the plan. I'm, I'm right with you, Leader. It's the chief objective. Now, having said that, for the housing production aspect of ameliorating, addressing homelessness, most of the projects will come to fruition in a couple of years, i.e., we fund them. So you saw we funded extremely low income, some 300 plus units. Already, they go through the pipeline. They have to seek their so-called entitlements, meaning planning and zoning approvals. Sometimes they're part of the way there. The project applicants sometimes, not at all. That takes time. Everything is done. The financing is lined up. Other sources are lined up. Then it's 18 to 24 months to build the thing, right? Under the best conditions with escalating construction costs and interest rates and all the variability, okay? So my point is we do need emergency measures as pertains to homelessness. Now, I would argue that legal services is an emergency measure, but we also need more shelters and centers. So we're doing a lot around that and I'll get into it, but that's more, the more full explanation. Thank you. Courtney. You're watching that, right? It was going, okay. Uh, just to add to around eviction prevention, so the Eviction Prevention Rhode Island program sunsetted on August 31st, and just to give some context, leader, for um, you, our two on one call center between that Friday, September 1st, and the Monday um, received 745 calls around eviction concerns. And so the need is still unbelievably significant and growing, and I know our partners at Rhode Island Housing also saw a similar volume of calling calls. Thank you for taking that on in the midst of everything. Do, if I may, do, do we, uh, Courtney, expect that that's going to grow? Will it remain sort of static, that need? Um, I'll if ask my if it's possible that you were able to forecast something that, like this, do, what do we expect? To the I'll, we know? I'll lean on our colleagues sure. who manage this um, on a daily basis, but I will say that usually when we see programs like this drop off, we continue to see growth. Um, the level of volume hasn't changed now that it's September 14th, and so we're still seeing that three times what we normally see in a given, a given day. Very concerning. Thank you. Uh, Brenda and then Melina. So uh, I think Melina had her hand up before, okay. so I apologize. I just wanted to respond to Courtney's comment. I just want to clarify, Courtney, that the what ended was the rent relief funding and money, not the not the eviction defense work that yeah. continues. Right. Right. Uh, but Thank you're you. absolutely right that that uh, it was a very yeah. sad day at court um, that day uh, when we knew we weren't going to have that resource anymore. Um, uh, the data shows that. Um, the majority of people who are coming to the um, right, uh, right, um, the eviction diversion desks are people who are earning less than 30 percent of median income, and so they are uh, rents just too high, regardless of whether or not um, they are receiving assistance or not. Without a rent relief program moving forward, funded through state resources or others, um, it's going to be difficult to um, to keep people housed. Thank you. Melina, please. Thanks. Um, I figured I'd try to give the leader a, a, some semblance of an answer, and you should expect that number to rise, uh, because folks' income is here, and rents are here, and so those gaps are going to continue. Um, and I do agree that I think the legal defense work is really critical um, work to ensure that people could stay housed, but a complementary resource is rental assistance, mm -hmm. um, because people are often being evicted for non-payment of rent and so just the provision of legal service alone creates perhaps a gentler transition or in a little bit more time but it isn't going to change the fact um, that they need to pay rent um, and i'm glad you mentioned something um, relative to shelter you know obviously housing is the solution to homelessness um, 
And so that is one crisis that we have, but we certainly have another crisis, and I see I'm jumping ahead to a different slide, um, where you've made reference to the number of shelter beds that you're bringing on, mm -hmm. but relative to the need for shelter beds or alternative shelter solutions, um, this number is inadequate, um, given the rise that we're seeing in the unhoused population. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to something that's been, I feel like, percolating in the department since your predecessor around exploring um, state-owned properties for the use of shelter in the short term um, while developing long-term solutions to convert into housing. Melina, are you referring to slide 16 on page 8? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Secretary, so, feel free. Um, I can affirm that we are looking at all property categories, including state property, for the purpose. Um, it is definitively an all of the above effort as pertains to shelter, meaning that we will look to different configurations of space. Um, it's less preferable to uh, set up congregate shelters, but we do need them. Um, as we move towards the winter and as we produce housing stock over the course of the next couple of years, we need spaces where Rhode Islanders can avoid staying outside in the severe cold. Uh, that's the truth of the matter. So we're working on a variety of fronts for that purpose. What you see on this particular displayed slot, re recent increases in shelter capacity, is that yes, we have in a variety of geographic areas in our state with a, a variety of property types already set up new shelters and centers, when the large-scale congregate center located at the armory was ramped down, we ramped up new beds, approximately 150 new beds, either expansions or altogether new. We've also extended last year's winter shelters for continuing operations to ensure that Rhode Islanders, uh, during the warmer weather, have a place to go and in general have shelter to seek. Uh, so we've done that to ensure that we have uh, greater resources applied than in the past. You can see the display of towns, Providence, Warwick, Woonsocket, North Smithfield, Pawtucket, Westerly Smithfield, Providence, all have stepped up uh, and we're in conversations with many more. We've convened, working with the League of Cities and Towns, we have convened uh, two separate meetings with mayors and managers in our offices one up on a broad set of topics, the second discussing housing programming but focusing with intensity on the winter and on shelter and centers. And we have been following up with mayors and managers on sites that they deem suitable and possible. Um, we're also working with property owners and managers. Uh, we're working with faith communities. Uh, we're working in a variety of places to set up uh, shelters and centers. Uh, the Point in time count shows that upwards of 300 Rhode Islanders are unsheltered despite our shelter system. Uh, so we need to do work. So we're doing this in a variety of ways. I want to focus on this, if I may, on page 18. Um, there are solutions that may uh, be best focused on a given community within the broader population of Rhode Islanders experiencing homelessness, and I want to speak to homeless families. So um, we have an opportunity, I think, to focus in this area in that um, there are states and other jurisdictions that have focused with intensity on families with children to ensure that they move towards and, in fact, achieve functional zero, meaning that any family that seeks shelter can find it. We're not there yet. There's a lot of work to be done, but the numbers are smaller, and uh, quite frankly, the receptivity at the local level is sometimes higher, not always, but sometimes higher, and we've had some successes in this area. Um, by the way, 35% of unsheltered individuals are families with children. Uh, the Department of Children, Youth, and Families is currently housing more than 100 families in hotels. None of us would prescribe hotels as permanent residences as an ideal place to raise children. Um, and there are dozens of families on the waiting list for shelter. Now, to be noted, that's too many. But it's not hundreds. We can do this. I want to give uh, credit to Courtney Nicolato for 
also identifying this issue and um, decisively uh, and with emphasis. And there may be opportunities for real collaboration here. And one of the things that I want to say, we'll have more to say about this in the future, some of the work in the family homelessness domain is already happening. So if you look at this slide, um, we have a partnership with Amos House. We originally partnered to thir house 31 families back in 2021. Which Since slide, the, I'm sorry, which slide is that, what number? This is 15. 15? 15. We sorry for jumping We have slide numbers and page numbers, by the way, so, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to say that again? Yep. 15, page 8. Slide page 15, page 8. Page eight. Slide 15. Yep. So Amos, thanks to Amos House's work, uh, the original 31 families have found permanent housing. Just want to note that. This is family homelessness, families with children. And now we've expanded to create 47, uh, we've, we've presented to 47 families the option to locate at the Charles Gate in Providence. Unfortunately, the Charles Gate closed, having nothing to do with any of this work. And we immediately sought opportunities for utilization of this facility in Providence for the purpose of serving Rhode Islanders experiencing homelessness. Uh, it is well known we're in negotiations for the purchase of the site. Even in the interim, that may or may not come to pass, even in the interim, we helped Amos House secure a lease and funded it for 47 families. This can be done. We can find spaces conducive to families. If we multiple times bring approximately 50 families into locations across the state, we can significantly chip away at, in fact, substantially address this problem. So just wanna say a theme to be followed up upon in the future, working with the United Way, working with community partners, we think this is an area where we can tailor our efforts and we can accomplish real progress and we'll have more to say about staffing in this area to Molina's earlier question, particular st collaborative staffing within the state government to address this problem. Caitlin. Thank you and I just first want to echo some of the comments that I've heard earlier from um, you know, Melina and Courtney about the overwhelming demand and also the need for both prevention and shelter beds. I just want to echo that I agree with them. Um, and I also do, you know, applaud the focus on family homelessness, but I think one thing all of us are aware of is that um, homelessness in general is not necessarily just a housing issue, it's an income issue, but you also have um, Rhode Islanders that are interacting with different systems, whether it's, you know, Department of Labor, you're, they're aging out of foster care, potentially a young parenting child, and the states that you've spoken of that have uh, made significant progress towards functional zero are utilizing all of the tools in their toolbox. So yeah. there is temporary assistance for yeah. needy families. Yes. There are communities where for that sure. is dedicated to rapid rehousing rental assistance for families, and it's a wonderful resource that we're not currently using yes. for that. So I would love to hear more about how we're going to include not just the housing department, but other departments in that work. And in those communities, interagency councils have often been used to leverage that. So I would love to hear how we can really achieve this through a very holistic view, because even prevention, prevention's Definitely. gonna need all sorts of Definitely. different partnerships. Thank you. Um, we have thankfully, uh, to the credit of EOHHS, teamed up with Secretary Charest for this work, um, and Director Deckert at DCYF. Uh, we're partnering across government for these purposes with the very point that you're making in our sites, which is that there are resources that are undertapped or untapped. TANF is definitely one of them. Medicaid is definitively another. Uh, so a couple things, we've taken some steps already. First of all, we're teaming up in this way. This is, in my, um, you know, going on nine years working at these uh, various interrelated issues, first time I've seen it where th there's this level of collaboration. Uh, by the way, EOHHS has always cared about these issues, but this kind of collaboration, given the presence of the housing department and a proper emphasis, it, it's, in my experience, unprecedented. But also, in our Consolidated Homeless Fund issuance, which I think everyone knows, but just to repeat, our CHF solicitation 
is the set of intertwined funds issued to homeless service providers in the main on an annual basis. We did a lot new with it this year. We set forth priorities and principles, and we also set forth some new threshold requirements. Among the threshold requirements, we asked every applicant, what are you doing to simultaneously serve homelessness, serve Rhode Islanders experiencing homelessness, address homelessness, and draw upon Medicaid? So it's a question that everyone needs to respond to so that we know that if we spend our precious dollars, you're already leveraging to the extent that you can Medicaid. So it's just one step, but these steps matter a lot. The signaling you do in a formal funding application. We have so much more work to do, and when I spoke to the staffing that Hannah and I are now doing collaboratively across the government, more to say when it's fully done, but we will have a focal point staff member that works for all of us in the government pertaining to family homelessness and some of these issues that we are talking about now, meaning Medicaid, TANF, and other untapped and undertapped funding sources. Yes, please follow up, Caitlin. And then Can David, I just make and a request that a family with lived experience of homelessness is potentially also part of that, so that those that are For sure. um, facing housing insecurity or have faced it in the past are also, you know, about us, with us. Must you know. be. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. We have uh, a question from David and Jen, and then nobody here. Okay, and then we're going to ask you to close with a conversation about the plan. Please. Sure. There was, I don't know if it still exists, there was for a long time interagency yeah. task force on homelessness. Right. Is that still in existence? It, it isn't in the sense of functioning. When we so, arrived at housing, it didn't, so I, it didn't I, exist okay. yet. Yeah. yeah, so I, you know, I looked at the, the yeah. provisions that created it. It was exactly for Caitlin's point, which seems to me really an obvious one. And yeah. so I would urge you mm -hmm. To encourage whoever has the authority to recreate that, yeah. to bring all those agencies yeah. not in for an ad hoc and you know, when it makes sense, but for a regular, enduring yeah. monthly conversation yeah. to see the impact. Because if we just address housing in isolation, we will never solve this problem. And that was the reason interagency task force was created. Yeah. For many of us, it's kind of surprising that it doesn't exist yeah. anymore. Yeah. And I would just urge you as the Secretary, to yeah. do everything you can to make sure that that's recreated. I think, in swiftly. the general sense, it's a good idea that we must have a structure where we all coordinate and we have different stakeholders at it. So, affirming that point, I will say that's a formal public body as a formal task force, which has a definitive role. Here we are, has a definitive role. Just no, that's like a, this. actually no. I mean, I would say it's it's quite different. It's actually to be sure, all the levers of state government oh, are working closely together to respond to this in a holistic way. I think I that is quite different than this body right here. Well, but the thing, what I'm pointing out is it's a formal body like this, and what I'm saying is we need that, and we also need the informal internal to the administration yeah, of course, coordination. Of course. That, yeah. That's your job as a secretary, that's yeah. informal stuff. But I'm just saying, I would just urge yeah. you that I think there's a reason that right. many other states, maybe yeah. every other state, yeah. has an interagency task force on homelessness except us. Like, right. I think we ought to, anything we can do at the Rhode Island Foundation to help make Point that taken. happen. Thank you. Um, and Jennifer. Thank you. Um, speaking of the need for the whole of government approach to this thorny challenge, right? Um, I was personally surprised to learn recently that the coordinated entry system is actually not inclusive of all the persons who are experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. That, for instance, the hundred or so families who are housed in hotels by DCYF right. are not reflected in those numbers. Yeah. Um, and then, in fact, um, shelters um, that do not receive consolidated homeless funds are not obligated to enter their data into HMIS. And I think that that's important for this commission to know because I think that it really, um, when we look at how critical accurate data is, if we're not actually looking at the totality of the picture, we're, we're misguided. Yeah. Um, and the fact is that even for to understand what is the state's investment in housing and homelessness, there's pockets of money in BDH, Buddha, forgive BDH. me, it's just easier to say, yeah. uh, in you know DCYF, et cetera, right? And if we can consolidate all of that, it, it also helps with Medicaid match, as an example, right? So um, I would just really in, in 
that I think is a very noteworthy thing that I don't think everyone understands. Um, and then the issue of Medicaid, I'm really glad that EOHHS has put out a technical assistance um, RFP recently to ask providers, how can we help you start billing for Medicaid? Mm -hmm. I took a look at that and I would like to think our organization is has pretty great sophistication on how to build for these certain things and it is exceptionally complex. So what additional layers of complexity Rhode Island may have layered upon the rules that are are not necessary. So like so what can we strip away to make it easier because it is um, an incredibly burdensome process right now. Thank you. There are many layers that are Rhode Island driven and low Rhode Island uh, supple supplemented or superimposed, so you're right. It, it, there's the, the CES system and its intersection with the HMIS system might appear to be all federally mandated. It's not in the way that we operate in Rhode Island, so you're right. There's multiple, and you're getting at this, features that were done in effect on a discretionary basis. Now, having said that, on your exact point regarding DCYF families, Ms. Moore, do you want to reply? Sure. So we, we actually have convened with the help of the, the efforts that Stefan's already been describing, we're really focusing on family homelessness. We've met together with the coalition to end homelessness, who's the CES and HMIS provider, the lead entity for the state, together with DCYF. And we've talked about some of the exact issues you're describing, and we worked out a plan to do, in some ways, exactly what you're asking for, which is to get these families into the same data system that we have for the rest of the family, so that we can work together on exit plans. We can really try to partner with the, the FCCPs that DCYF works with to, to really try and get these families, as Stephen was saying, not in a hotel. That's just not the goal. So, and then on the, your points around the broader HMIS collaboration, which the HMIS system, it's, 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 um, it's fundamental to our ability to know how we're doing, and there's a lot more work to be done. So uh, we're, we're eager to to lean in as we're staffing up and making sure that we're both working with providers with the technical assistance that they need together with the coalition and the continuum of care which plays a very very important role in in this work and making sure that we we as you know a funder can can help continue to re reinforce that point we'll go to leader chippendale melina caitlin and then i want you to say a couple words about the plan before Please. we we close thank you leader uh thank you madam chair very very briefly uh, i think the utilization of resources and the partnerships around homelessness and the things that you've done are fantastic um and this is not directed to you or anyone here uh, but i think it's important that we all rem remember that these the beds at charles gate would not be available if another segment of vulnerable rhode islanders disabled and elderly uh rhode islanders weren't displaced so it was one track Tragedy that allowed uh, a little bit of relief in the other area, but we have a lot of work to do in both. We do. Thank you, Leader Melina. I agree with that point because I feel like often we are choosing one, solving one problem at the expense of another, but that's not why I raised my hand. Um, I, I actually wanted to echo something Jen had said, um, and then I wanted to ask a question um, relative to sort of what we know about homelessness aside from the DCYF folks and, and non federally funded shelters. Um, our homeless system is based on self-reporting. Um, and so if somebody doesn't self-report their episode of homelessness for, you know, all sorts of reasons, um, then those are folks that we're not capturing. So I think any numbers that we have relative to homelessness are really talking about what we know and not really what we don't know. So it could be somewhat of an iceberg effect. Um, but speaking about interdepartmental uh, coordination, um, I just wanted to ask whether the Department um, of Education, the RIDE report relative to um, vacant and abandoned school buildings, is, there was supposed to be a report that was submitted to your office and yeah. was supposed to be made public, so I'm curious about what the status of that is as we're talking yeah. about available uh, municipal space rather than state-owned property. Yeah. They've provided us with preliminary information and we are uh, set to meet with the commissioner and her team to drill further in. So in some instances, we've been able to use the preliminary information in speaking with mayors and town managers to say, is this school available? Is that school available? Uh, but uh, we are asking Rye to do a deeper dive for us. Thank you. And Caitlin, and then to the plan. All right, thank you. I'll try to be brief. Um, I did just want to provide some clarification on the two systems that we discussed today. So 
um, it's correct that there are service providers that potentially are not state or federally funded that don't participate in HMIS. There's also an extent to which some state departments may have programs that they operate, you know, family FCCP, you know, there's different things that there may be assistance delivered that isn't in HMIS because it's not kind of HUD funded. But that is the type of thing that your partnership, you know, behind the scenes, certainly an interagency council can help ensure that data is um, collected and looked at. And I mean, we have a state data warehouse that can be used. For the coordinated entry system, which is the access point to shelter in the state, um, it's not so much that those who call, whether they're in a hotel that's paid for by DCYF or in their own hotel they're paying for or some other situation, it's not that they're not in CES, it's that the resources that are available, which are limited, are not prioritized to them because what the continuum of care has generally prioritized is those who are outside getting the resources first. So in a scenario where there were enough resources, whether it was shelter beds or even you know, housing problem solving, dispersion funding, more individuals could access those. It's more when you have so little that then there isn't enough to go around. So I did want to say that it's not that people couldn't call and seek referral or be quote unquote on a list depending on their situation. It's that there's just not enough there, which you know prevention and more resources would help address. Thank you. <clears throat> we may need to dedicate an entire meeting to the, the issue of of homelessness. So thank you all for that. Now, if you could just in the three minutes remaining, yes, talk to us about the plan. For sure. So um, as you all know, uh, when we arrived, uh, Congressman, with thanks to the Rhode Island Foundation um, and uh, Neil uh, in his generosity, and thank you for also continuing to focus upon this, we had a report prepared through philanthropic dollars uh, for the Rhode Island Foundation. Uh, by the Boston Consulting Group. That was a precursor to state planning activity regarding both housing and homelessness. It was well in excess of 100 pages. We've reviewed it at this commission. So we deliberately wanted to get started even sooner than a formal procurement would enable and also give a boost to the official state planning activities regarding housing. That's a preface. We're pleased to have uh, worked subsequently to ensure that we can complete the procurement and proceed with a team to carry out state planning work regarding housing. Um, uh, this slide displays for you some of the anticipated activities, an assessment of current and future housing needs, evaluation of housing and homelessness, uh, the state uh, uh, status and possibilities, identification of barriers to housing development to ameliorating homelessness, etc. cetera. Um, incorporation of approaches to increase household income to enable Rhode Islanders to cover housing costs. So what can we do uh, with uh, programs aimed at empowering residents, residents economically to ensure that they have greater spending power? All of these things taken together, uh, we aim to build upon and supplement the governor's Rhode Island 2030 plan in carrying out this work certainly the chapter regarding housing, but also drawing upon others, as you can hear in what I'm describing, the economy comes into play, and so do other, other aspects. Um, through the procurement process, we have vetted a strong set of applicants and have made a selection. Um, pleased to report that the housing department has selected Apt Associates, a renowned global planning and analytics firm. Um, it's a firm that has done extensive work in the housing field in particular. They've uh, contributed to or produced plans in New Hampshire and New Mexico. Uh, there uh, was a, in the 2000s uh, a planning exercise that they did right here in Rhode Island uh, for the Housing Resources Commission. Um, the team includes strong professional connections to our own state and familiarity with Rhode Island and with New England, uh, including uh, participants who have been practitioners right here in Rhode Island. And um, the APT Associates organization has been a provider of HUD TA, HUD technical assistance, in areas including housing. Um, APT Associates is part of a team of, of 
consultants or vendors. Root Policy is one of them. Root Policy has managed housing market research studies for a couple decades uh, and has completed over 100 housing market studies. So they will feature prominently in our work. Um, working with APT Associates, we will conduct significant outreach to key stakeholders, inclusive of this very commission, inclusive of housing advocates, housing developers, nonprofit and for-profit within our state, including economists, including scholars of the field of housing, including individuals with lived experience, including uh, all manner of stakeholders in the course of this work. There will be multiple public forums that are convened. There'll be smaller settings. Uh, we anticipate that the work, if you look at the right-hand side of the slide, we anticipate that this work will be iterative. Um, it will not result in a single plan as the only product. Instead, we anticipate that there will be interim or draft or partial product in the late winter, in the spring, <coughs> and uh, late uh, in 2024, among the times that there are components that are issued. Much, much more to say, and in fact, uh, we'd like to visit this commission, Madam Chair, as you see fit, with the app team and to seek the collective input of this group. And obviously, we'll be reaching out to individual participants here. We want to, this is our first uh, expression of the selection and of uh, these uh, prospective efforts uh, because we want to make sure to s consult this commission that's been so invaluable to our work. Uh, so uh, we want to bring it to you all first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So when we open the plan, we will know how many housing units we need in Rhode Island, for what income classes, what kinds of units, where's the best place to put them, how to pay for them, and how long it's going to take to get them? Approximately, yes. Approximately. What I will say is this. <laughs> well, what I'll say is this. <laughs> what I'll say is this. Some of the points you're making, you can tell I speak with precision. I try to. I fumble. I even trip and fall sometimes when I, uh, when I say things as we all do. But what I will say is I try to speak with precision. Exactly how to frame those questions and the kinds of answers that we'll propose is part of the question we want to ask stakeholders and indeed the public. What should we prescribe? What should we predict? And what should be left more to regional, i.e. within Rhode Island regional, determination, what should be decided at the municipal level, what requires more analysis at, on a topical level or a subject matter level. So I, that's the only reason I don't say yes quickly. Yeah. It just all requires being said uh, with greater precision when we know more. I will say this. Will we aim to set goals forth that enable our state to grow housing stock in general and to focus on the development of affordable housing stock in particular? Yes, we will. So given the, the breadth of knowledge at this table and the sort of scope of the stakeholders across the space, we should probably have that team in sooner rather than later. Would love that, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. Great. If you we'll, see fit. we'll work on setting that up. Thank you. Melina, quickly, please. <laughs> I'm not going to get to the other six pages of questions. Um, so I think to that end, you know, can you talk a little bit about what the timing for this is? Because sure. you know, we're about 18 months in already, so what you're describing here is probably another done properly 12 to 18 month process uh, to come up with the plan. And meanwhile, you're building a lot of other scaffolding yeah. uh, of players who are going to be flying a plane without a flight plan. Yeah, you, you see displayed, and I just said out loud, the, some of the components of the timeline even the timeline itself, that's the late winter, the spring, and the late 2024 articulation. Uh, so that's the frame we'll enter this process with. But I want to ensure that stakeholders have a chance to tell us, we really need these deliverables by this time frame. I want that to be part of the process. Uh, so we aim for that. But you have before you 
uh, some preliminary benchmarks that as a draft we aim for. So I promise a hard stop at 2.30. I've already missed that. I've broken that promise and I apologize. So um, we, we have many more questions for you, as you can tell. I want to thank you very much for thank the presentation. You very much. And thank you, Hannah. Uh, and thank you to the commissioners for your great questions as always. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, all in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you all, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.